Chapter Two of Mary, Our Little Norwegian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mary, Our Little Norwegian Cousin by Mary Hazelton Blanchard Wade. Visitors Mother, mother, I hear the sound of wheels, cried the little girl as she came hurrying into the house, panting for breath. The baby was such a big load, it is a wonder she could hurry at all. Did you see what is coming? asked her mother. Yes, there are two carriages. I know, for I saw a carryall, and I could hear another gig, although it was still out of sight around the bend of the road. They must be in a hurry, for I could hear the driver of the carryall clucking to his horse to make him go faster. Run right down to the rye field, Mary, and tell your father to send Snorri up with the horses. Leave the baby with me. Mary hurried away while her mother went into the yard to greet her visitors who had now drawn near. The first carriage was a carryall, as Mary had said. It was a sort of gig with very long shafts. It had a seat in the front just wide enough to hold one person, with a small behind, where the postboy sat. A lady rode in this carryall and drove the sturdy little horse. Behind her came a second carriage, which could not be very comfortable, as there were no springs and the seat was directly over the axle. Two people were in this also, a gentleman and the driver. We are in great haste to reach the next station by afternoon, the gentleman tried to explain to the farmer's wife. He spoke brokenly for he seemed to know but few Norwegian words. He must be an American, Mary's mother said to herself. Those people always seem to be in a hurry. She dropped a deep curtsy to the lady, who seemed to be the gentleman's wife. Won't you come into the house while you wait for your carriage? she asked. The lady smiled and followed her into the living room. What a lovely big fireplace you have, exclaimed the visitor as she sat down, and what good times you probably have here in the long winter evenings. Indeed, they seem long when the daylight only lasts for two or three hours. Mary's mother smiled. Yes, and the summer days seem long now that there are only two or three hours of darkness in the whole twenty-four, she answered. At least, they must seem long to you who are a stranger, she went on. She spoke in good English, of which she was very proud. She had learned it when she was a girl in school, and was already teaching Mary to use it. Is that your spinning wheel? asked the visitor, as she looked round the room. Excuse me for asking, but I do wish I could watch you spinning. In America, everything we wear is made in the mills and factories, and a spinning wheel is not a common sight nowadays. I make all the clothing for my family, answered Mary's mother. It is so strong that it lasts nearly a lifetime. Look at my dress. I have worn it every working day for many years, and it is still as good as new. Dear me, what a smart woman you are. If you don't mind, I should like to examine the goods. I suppose that is what people call homespun, and I suppose the wool of which it was made came from your own sheep, did it not? Yes, indeed, and my husband raised every one of the flock himself, was the answer. I will gladly spin some of the wool for you now. But see, the carriages are waiting, and your husband looks impatient. Then I must not keep him waiting, for we have a long journey before us. So good-bye. Perhaps we may stop here again on our way back from the north. Thank you very much for your kindness. The lady went out, and Snorri helped her into the carryall, and himself jumped behind, and away they went. The lady's husband followed in another carriage, in the same manner they had driven into the yard. The ones that had brought them here had gone away as soon as the travelers stepped out. Their drivers would take them back to the station where they belonged. Mother, why is our house a posting station? asked Mary when the travelers had gone. I think it is a great bother. No matter how busy father and the men are, they must stop their work and harness up the horses to carry strangers along the road. They don't get money for it either, do they? That is the way your father pays his taxes, her mother answered. You know what good roads we have in our country, Mary. You know, too, that many other things are done by the government to make this country a fine one. 
of course every one must share in the cost of things as we live on a farm and have horses your father is allowed to pay his share in work that is he agrees to carry the travellers who come this way to the next station after all it isn't very much bother she said thoughtfully but come dear set the table it is nearly dinner time and your father will be here soon the table did not stand in the middle of the room it was in the corner nearest the fireplace a wide bench was built round the two sides of the room nearest it so that most of those who gathered around the table could sit on these benches mary's mother soon had a steamy junket ready besides a dish of smoked salmon plenty of boiled potatoes a large dark-colored cheese which looked like soap and last but not least a plate was piled high with flatbread may father have the cakes i made asked mary sure enough little daughter he will eat them with pleasure i know in a few minutes the farmer with his helpers appeared all gathered around the table together what a fine junket this is to-day said mary's father as his wife helped him to another plateful the junket was made of milk barley and potatoes and was a dish of which he was very fond dear me how good this flatbread is too and only to think that our little mary made it all herself continued the farmer she will soon be a woman at this rate mary's cheeks grew redder still at her father's praise i shall be glad to see gretel back again said the little girl's mother after a while i miss her very much though mary is a good little helper but gretel is having a good time with hendrik i am sure gretel and hendrik had gone up on the mountain to the summer house where the cows were pastured during the two warmest months of the year hendrik was now fourteen years old and his father felt that he could be trusted to care for the cows as well as he could do it himself while gretel could make good cheese and butter although she was only thirteen this boy and girl were now living together all alone up on the mountainside but they were not the least bit lonely every saturday afternoon hendrik brought down the butter and cheese his sister had made during the week he had so many stories to tell of their good times that mary would say oh hendrik i wish i could go back with you i wish you could little sister but mother must not be left alone you know and hendrik would put his arms round her and kiss her lovingly where is ole asked the farmer as the family finished eating their dinner he should not be late to meals and give you trouble good wife he went up to the river on a fishing trip i told him that i should not scold him if he was late this time said his mother i was glad of the thought of having some fresh salmon very well then but come my men we must get back to the field now the noon hour has passed and the farmer led his way out of the house but before he rose from the table little mary said thanks for the food dear father and mother and she went first to one and then the other and gave each of them a loving kiss then the workmen rose and went in turn to the farmer and wife and shook hands to show they too were thankful it was very pleasant and cheerful in this farmer's house you can plainly see and it was all quite natural for these simple country people to show how kindly they felt for each other there comes ole now said the farmer's wife i can hear his call run mary and see if he has met with good fortune oh mother mother see what i have here cried mary after a few moments afterward ole has a fine string of fish and that will please you i know but do look at this young magpie it was snared in his trap while he was fishing he says i may have it for my very own may i keep it please it seems as though you have enough pets now mary you have your very own pony and your dog kyle but i hate to refuse you my dear you may have it but you and ole must keep it out of mischief magpies are sometimes very troublesome birds for they notice shining objects and carry them off if they get a chance mary's mother now turned to the string of trout which she hastened to put away in the storeroom ole had cleaned them nicely before he brought them home he now ate his dinner as quickly as possible after which he and his sister went out into the yard to make a cage for their new pet 
In a little while he will get tame, so he will follow us around, said Ole, as he cut the wooden bars for the cage. Then we shall need to shut him up only when we wish. Isn't he a beauty? exclaimed Mary as she stroked the magpie. Look, Ole, at the green and purple feathers in his wings and tail. They are very handsome and glossy. Be careful, Mary, or he may bite you. That hooked bill of his is pretty sharp, if he is a young bird. See him look at you with his bright eyes? They say that magpies will grow very fond of one in a very short time. Did you ever see a magpie nest, Ole? Yes, I passed one this morning as I went through the woods. It was way back in a thick bush. I crept up and looked in. The mother bird was away, and I saw five pretty green eggs dotted with little purple spots. What did you do, Ole? I hope you did not touch them. At first I thought I would, Mary. Because, you know, those pretty eggs will sometime hatch out, and the five magpies will fly away to harm smaller and more helpless birds. Besides, they go into grain fields and pick up the grain. Father isn't very fond of magpies, I can tell you. But after thinking for a moment, I said to myself, No, Mother Magpie shan't be made unhappy today by coming home to find her nest empty. Then I went away and ended my morning sport by trapping this young fellow. Ole kept on working while he talked. He did his work so cleverly that one could see he was quite a carpenter. He was a tall boy for twelve years, and he looked happy and healthy. You might possibly have laughed at his clothes, for he wore a pair of his father's old trousers, and they were gathered at the waist to keep them in place. They must have been cut off at the knees so that they should not be too long for the boy. That was the only change made. His mother said, there, those trousers are much too worn for my husband to use any longer. They will do very well for Ole as he runs about on the farm. I will not take the time to cut them any smaller. On holidays, the boy shall wear his fine clothes, of course. It is no wonder the good woman had to be careful of her time, for she not only spun, wove, and made her clothing, but she also spun the yarn and knit their stockings. Ole's stockings were often patched, with leather to make them last longer, but his feet are not tender, and he does not mind in the least. What kind of nest did the magpie have? asked Mary, as Ole finished the cage, and they placed the bird inside. It was lined with wool and hair, and had a sort of roof over it. The opening was very narrow. I really don't see how the mother bird could get in and out. I suppose the roof is to protect the young birds from the enemies, don't you, Ole? Yes, Mary, but come. Let us go and find some worms for our bird. He must be hungry. End of chapter 2